Hello, everyone. I hope you, it's very happy. Uh, I'm Giacomo Beccari. I'm uh, back again. I hope you are all fine. Uh, on behalf of the ESO Office for Science and the Director of Science, we are very happy to, to start again our um, a series of duologues. Uh, of course, we, we, we are very proud, very happy to have this, this to open again this, this flow for this you know, format of discussion to focus on some um, interesting topic uh, for a broad view for, for our broad communities. Of course, we were, we hoped when we started last year that things, at least uh, in the situation abroad in the worldwide would have changed significantly. Unfortunately, we still have, uh, there are many people are still under, under big pressures and living a very difficult times, but we hope with this series to bring our scientific contribution to the community and, and, and as, as I said, to, to stimulate some interesting discussion on, on important topics of research. And in particular, this year we have uh, already a, a program ready that I'm showing here. So we basically, we will have a, a limited number of events. We have one event uh, every, at every last Tuesday at 3 p.m. local time in Germany here. Um, and we try to cover uh, three uh, purely scientific topics related to this, this today and, uh, and uh, one in March and in May. And plus we have two like social science uh, topic, which are still very interesting one on which happened next time uh, on February on open, open access astronomy. And then the other one on the use of metrics in evaluation processes. So we wanted to go also a bit beyond the poor uh, science, but sure that they're gonna be very, very interesting uh, duologues also. As you know, the format is, is as it was, as if you have shown, as you've seen the, the events of, of the last year, basically the format is always that you have two, um, two uh, speakers plus a moderator. And the idea is to have the two speakers, they will, they will present in 20 minutes their view or their perspective on a certain topic and followed by uh, uh, then a discussion which is moderated by the chair of the session. And you have, uh, everyone is very well, very welcome to basically make a contribute to the discussion by sending questions, either by using the form that we have on our page, duo.iso.org. If you go to the page, you will see it together with the program. You will also see that there is a form where you can send your questions in case you don't have a Google access or you want to leave your comment on the chat of, of YouTube or in the, in, in the other case, you can use the chat of YouTube. You can still um, send your comment, put it there. Uh, still, uh, I want to remind you that the, the, the event will stay on YouTube so you can watch it. it, can be seen basically later as all the series of last year, the episode of last year, they are still available on, on the channel in a dedicated, we created a, a list for, those, for that. Um, the event for today is the Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, Concordas or New Physics. So looking forward really to this uh, duologue. The speakers are uh, Brian Field, who is a professor of astronomy and physics at the University of Illinois. He, Brian had a PhD from University of Chicago and then he was a postdoc at the Institute of Astrophysic in Paris and then Notre Dame de Paris, the Notre Dame University and the University of Minnesota. Uh, he works on nuclear particle astrophysics, particularly in Big Bang nucleosynthesis, near her supernova explosion, cosmic ray and gamma rays. And Carlos Martins is uh, um, uh, from the, C uh, the Institute uh, CPU in Porto, in Portugal. He's also uh, uh, employed in Porto. Uh, sorry, I missed the, uh, I had wrote, written down, Carlos, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> I've written down uh, maybe Siri, if you can, or oh, Carlo, you can introduce. Uh, sorry, I had all, everything written down, but now I missed <laughs> the details. And then, we, sorry about that, Carlos. And then we have a moderator, Cyril Petru, who complemented the PhD in the uh, Institute of Astrophysics in Paris in 2008. And then, uh, after two postdocs in Norway and the UK, he was added in France in the, with the CNRS in 2012, and, and he's currently at the IAP. Uh, so Institute d'Astrophysique de Paris, and work mainly on CMB, CMB theory and isotropic cosmologies and neutrino uh, decoupling and BBN. But let me 
sorry for for completeness i, I think i should have the um, i should properly introduce carlos and apologies for that because he was very precise and sent me already the um, his his profile time ago and of course i had prepared it there. here you are Yes, so thank you. Sorry, sorry for that. So Carlos is a researcher at the Center of Astrophysics at uh, University of Porto. He studied physics and applied the mathematics, specializing in, astro in astrophysics and astronomy at the University of Porto and obtained his PhD in theoretical physics at the University of Cambridge. So beautiful CV, of course. His research focused on observational tests in early universe theories and is a member of several ESA and ESO scientific projects. So absolutely. Great, so thank you very much to, first of all, I would like to thank Carlos, Brian and uh, Cyril for, for uh, joining us and, and for giving the first uh, duologue. And I leave the floor now to um, Cyril to start the, um, the event. Thank you very much. Hi, Cyril. Thank you, uh, Giacomo. So let me share my screen. So I guess you can now all see my screen. So as a moderator of this uh, dialogue, I was asked to give a um, very brief in introduction of this topic, so of Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. So my title was Big Bang Nucleosynthesis in a nutshell. But in fact, the true title should be Big Bang Nucleosynthesis in five minutes. And the very reason for that is that, in fact, I just have five minutes for this introduction. And the truth is that Big Bang Nucleosynthesis itself has lasted essentially, the main part of it at least, really five minutes. So just imagine that, that the duration of this brief introduction is really just the actual duration of this major astrophysical process in cosmology. So that's one of the few things in astrophysics which has a time scale which is commensurate with the um, human life. So when this idea of big point nucleosynthesis has emerged, well, it dates back from a paper from 1948, this famous paper by Alpha, Bether, and Gamow. And in that paper, they were very enthusiastic because what they propose is that all chemical elements, that is all nuclei, were formed in the early universe. So today we know it's not the case. We know that most of elements were formed, I mean, the vast majority of elements were formed in stars when stars are, you know, consuming or are forming nuclear reactions. And of course, we know the, he the heavy elements are formed in violent events like supernova or stars explosion or things like that. But why were they so excited about the fact that nuclei could be formed in the early universe. Today, we know that only light elements can be formed in the early universe. But the very reason why they were excited and they, they, they thought that everything could have been formed in the early universe is that be, because there is a, a fundamental difference between what happens in stars and what happens in the early universe. In stars, the main process, at least the most famous, which is the formation of helium-4, you see here, two protons and two neutrons, is made from four protons here in the initial states. And so, which means that in that process, we must convert protons into neutrons. So at some point here, that's the part that I've circled in green, you see that there are two protons which fuse to give deuterium, but in deuterium, it's one proton and one neutron. So at the same time that there is this fusion, inside this fusion, there has to be a weak process, a weak interaction, which converts one of these protons into a neutrons here in blue. And because it's a weak interaction, this releases a neutrino, that's why the stars are emitting neutrinos, and some uh, positrons. However, the main difference with the pyramidal nucleosynthesis, that is with the pyramidal universe, is that in the pyramidal universe, there was plenty of neutrons. And so this raises two questions. There was, so when was it? When did it happen that there was plenty of neutrons? And how many neutrons were available in the early universe? So first, the first thing that I want to mention is that in the early universe, because we have neutrons, we can form deuterium out of the fusion of neutrons plus protons directly. And this releases photons of 2.2 mega electron volt because this is precise, precisely the binding energy of deuterium. But conversely, if you see it backwards, the fact that it releases a photon of 2.2 mega electron volt means that conversely, if you have photons which are typically of the order of the mega electron volt, they would destroy deuterium and they would prevent nucleosynthesis. So this means that nucleosynthesis in the early universe happens whenever the, the temperature of the universe drops below the mega electron volt. So here, this is a chart of the scale factor here on the vertical axis as a function of time in, in, in giga years. So today is 13 point, in years, sorry. So today is 13 point something giga years. If the scale factor was thousand times smaller, it's the electron volt era. That's when CMB was formed. That's when atoms have recombined and so on. And then in order to have a mega electron volt 
temperature of the photons, which are at the order of the mega electron volt, we have to go much earlier in time. And you see, we have to go at a fraction of a year. In fact, this fraction is so small that it's just a few seconds. In fact, a few hundred seconds. It's the time when the energy typically drops below the mega electron volt. And that's when we can form deuterium and have a nucleosynthesis. So that's the first question. When was it? A few seconds after the singularity of the Big Bang. Now, how many neutrons were available? This second question is answered knowing that this is controlled by weak interactions. Weak interactions are the typically reaction of the form neutron plus neutrino gives proton plus electron. And if we have enough interactions, then we have a statistical equilibrium between protons and neutrons. That, that is, they keep changing and their abundance is determined by the Boltzmann factor. But the fact that neutrons are slightly heavier than protons, they have 1.3 mega electron volt more of mass energy than the protons, means that when, whenever the temperature is low, then this statistical equilibrium will enforce that there are less neutrons than protons. So here on this plot, I've summarized in the dashed line what would be the evolution of the neutron abundance as a function of time. Here, you see on the horizontal axis, you have 0.01 second, one second, 100 second. The temperature is, is dropping below 10 mega electron volt, one mega electron volt, etc. So if we had always statistical equilibrium, then we would have the dashed line. However, these weak interactions, at some point, they start to freeze around here, around one second. And so we reach more like 20% of neutrons instead of reaching zero uh, around 10 seconds. Still, we're losing a little bit of neutrons because neutrons beta decay. And so you see that the beta decay of neutrons is going to enter this recipe. And at some point, around 100 seconds, so it's between three and five minutes, that's where we have deuterium synthesis. And once we have deuterium synthesis, we have only 12% of neutrons left, which means that we can still form a sizable amount of light elements, but we, st we will still be left with a huge amount of protons. And that's what happens. So you have a huge network of reactions. Deuterium plus proton gives helium-3, or then we will form tritium. But eventually, eventually, in all these reactions, nearly everything is going to end up into helium-4 because it has the most favorable binding energy. So the, 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 the typical picture that we produce with Big Bang nucleosynthesis is, is the, this one. We are showing the light which are produced and destroyed during, during this era of primordial nucleosynthesis. Typically, everything goes into helium-4, but in that process, not everything is used to form helium-4. There are still some traces of intermediary nuclei, which are deuterium, helium-3, tritium, which decays into helium-3, lithium-7, which is also produced, and barium-7, which decays into lithium-7. And so the game is to plot the observed values of these things, so helium-4, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7, and to compare with the theoretical predictions. And the theoretical prediction is the, are the blue, the, 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 the blue lines, and they depend on the barium abundance. So comparing this theoretical prediction and this observed value can be used somehow to constrain the barium abundance. However, we can also measure this barium abundance from CMB, and that's the vertical gray line. So which means that we need to look at the intersection of this CMB determined barium abundance and the theory of BBN, and just check if BBN is working well. And if it's not, then we, have, we are facing problems. So you can see that it's working really well for helium-4, rather well for deuterium. Helium-3 is not really constraining because the measurement we have on helium-3 is not very good. But still then, you can see on the bottom plot, the famous lithium-7 problem is that the theory, which is here, is about three times larger than the observed value. And that's one of the problems of BBN that the speakers of today are going to address. So today, I'm now I'm letting the floor to this two specialists of BBN, which are Brian Fields from University of Illinois and Carlos Martins from Portugal. So Brian Fields, I'll let you start with your presentation. All righty then. So can you see my screen? Is it real? Are we good? No, I cannot see your screen yet, but I will soon at some point. Wait. Yes, I can see it. It's fine. You can go. Excellent. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers, particularly Giacomo and Francesca, and thank Surreal for this perfect setup. Um, so I'm here because I have a problem. It's a, uh, and it's a problem with lithium. 
And this, this little picture here, you see you know, Walt and Jesse and there to remind us that lithium is present in our everyday lives, in our computer batteries, and I hear in psychoactive substances as well. Uh, but the problem I have with lithium is a more cosmic in nature. It's a problem with the primordial lithium abundance, which you already heard alluded to by Surreal. Um, so, uh, so Surreal uh, beautifully covered the basics of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. I wanna highlight a few of the key assumptions that'll be important for our story today. Uh, so something to appreciate is that Big Bang nucleosynthesis is wonderful because it is a symphony of the fundamental forces. It's one of the few arenas in nature where all four fundamental forces come into play. Uh, and you already heard this in, uh, in Surreal's talk. So that means uh, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis provides a unique arena because of all these forces. So you have uh, gravity is important, also the weak force, the electromagnetic force, and the, and the strong force through, through the nuclear interaction. Uh, and so that means the Big Bang nucleosynthesis is a unique test bed that can probe all of these fundamental interactions, and this will show up. Uh, so. Uh, so we will, uh, we will today be considering both standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis and models that go beyond that. So it's worth defining what, uh, what people generally mean by standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And basically it means you make the most straightforward uh, assumptions you can uh, about how things work. Uh, uh, in these first few minutes. So first, gravity, we will assume is described by general relativity. Uh, so that's the, that sets the cosmic stage. Then down at the level of microphysics, we assume that microphysics is described by the standard model of particle physics, in particular, that there are three uh, neutrino species, that they're light in mass, uh, uh, that they have left-handed couplings only, uh, and, uh, and also that they're non-degenerate, uh, which I simply mean that the, the lepton number of the universe is comparable to the baryon number. There's not some great mismatch, say, where the lepton number is a billion times higher than the baryon number. That's what I mean by that. Then that there's kinetic equilibrium, that is the nuclei described by uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions. Um, dark matter and dark energy, they're present today, so they must be present in the early universe. Uh, presumably, but these are non-interacting and they, uh, they should not be important uh, for our story. Uh, also, the universe is homogeneous and in the early universe, very homogeneous. Uh, and so this key parameter that Surreal already alluded to, the ratio of baryons to photons that controls the goings on, that ratio, which we call eta, uh, is spatially constant. It's the same everywhere. So this one parameter, one key parameter is the same everywhere as so you just need to know one number uh, uh, to, to describe what's going on. Uh, also, subsequent to Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the expansion is adiabatic, and so the ratio of baryons to photons should remain constant after Big Bang nucleosynthesis through the CMB uh, to today. So even though the number density of baryons and photons individually are changing, their ratio remains fixed and should be the same at the end of Big Bang nucleosynthesis all the way to today. And just to, uh, uh, just to alert you, and this ratio of baryons to photons, it's easy to show that's also proportional to the baryon density today, or if you like the baryon density parameter, in fact, omega b times h squared, or it's the inverse of the entropy per baryon. Okay, so that's those are all these the assumptions that go into standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and we will see in attempts to solve the lithium problem, we will consider non-standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which relax these assumptions. All right, very good. So Surreal gave you an overview of how the elements are formed. I, since we're interested in lithium, I wanted to highlight how lithium is made uh, in standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So first of all, in standard Big Bang nucleosynthesis, when we say lithium, we really mean lithium-7. Of the two lithium isotopes, lithium-7 by far is the one that's made uh, dominantly. The lithium-6 abundance is not zero, but it is negligible. Um, Second, lithium-7, what is today lithium-7, is in fact made as beryllium-7 dominantly, uh, and, uh, uh, and only much later does beryllium-7, which is unstable, capture an electron. It does this actually around recombination when the CMB uh, is released. It captures an electron and then decays to lithium-7. Uh, so by the time we can make any measurements today, it's lithium-7, but in the early universe, in fact, it's produced as beryllium-7. Uh, 
And the way beryllium-7 is produced, there's really only one important reaction. So it's the combination of helium-3 and helium-4, uh, which capture to make uh, beryllium-7. But then the beryllium-7 is destroyed, and it's, it's a two-step process to destroy it. So first, the beryllium-7 captures a neutron and is changed to lithium-7 in a proton. So you'll notice, hey, wait, that's still mass seven. So the total amount of uh, mass seven, lithium and beryllium is the same, but that actually is progress because lithium seven has less charge, a lower Coulomb barrier, and then it's uh, more easily destroyed uh, by, uh, uh, by interactions with protons that then uh, change it to, uh, to helium. Uh, and in the end, the, 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 the beryllium, the mass seven is destroyed. So a key point here is you see that neutrons are critical to change the the beryllium to lithium, so we can then destroy the lithium. And so neutrons are lithium poison. So if you want to get rid of uh, uh, beryllium or lithium, you need neutrons. All right, so we saw this plot already. So the result of Big Bang nucleosynthesis is for this one free parameter, the ratio of baryons to photons or the baryon density, it's some number somewhere along in this axis, we get predictions for all of the light elements. Um, and, uh, uh, and so Cyril already summarized this. The, you'll notice that the scales are different. Helium-4, you always get somewhere around 25% of the baryons by mass uh, in helium-4. Uh, deuterium is made in trace amounts. Notice this is about parts in 10 to the 5, and lithium is down here in parts in 10 to the 10. Um, and the theoretical widths are the uh, uncertainties due to the nuclear cross sections, which were the dominant contribution. And, oh yeah, and I just wanted to emphasize, notice the anti-correlation. As the universe makes less deuterium, it makes more lithium. And that's also important for our story. All right, so that's the theory. Now we wanna compare with observations. So we need to go measure the light elements. And so ideally we'd like to measure primordial abundances after three minutes of all these light elements all in the same place. But it's sort of like the drunk uh, looking for his, uh, his keys. You look under the lamppost because that's where you can look. And it turns out we can't look at for all the light elements in their primordial state all in one place. So we look where we can in different sites for the different, the different species. So first for deuterium, uh, the measurements are made. The primordial deuterium is best measured in high redshift systems and in redshift about three galaxies that are backlit by quasars. Uh, these are quasar absorption line systems. And there are these beautifully precise measurements. Uh, and in the past several years, the measurements have become incredibly precise. So deuterium is measured to 1%. It's phenomenal. Um, and that's very constraining as we'll see. Helium-4, the dominant pro uh, product of Big Bang nucleosynthesis is measured in, uh, in hot regions of ionized gas, so H2 regions, in metal poor galaxies near the Milky Way. Um, and, uh, and it can be measured quite well. Uh, but interestingly, there's now a new development. The microwave background, the, the CMB, uh, can also measure the, uh, the helium abundance in the damping tail. So now there's an independent uh, way to measure the helium abundance with the CMB. Lithium-7, we'll say much more about this, but spoiler, lithium-7 is measured in met metal poor halo stars in our own Milky Way, so old stars in our Milky Way galaxy, and now there are also some extragalactic observations as well. Um, and then finally, as Cyril uh, mentioned, helium-3, it's also measured in the Milky Way, but, can, but it can't be measured in primitive environments. It's only measured in uh, high metallicity environments that are already contaminated by stars, and so it's not really useful for, for cosmology. So really, only deuterium, helium-3, and lithium are, are really useful for cosmology. So now we go back to this plot, uh, where again, these are the primordial abundances, and there's the universe has some baryon to photon ratio. We're trying to understand what it is. Um, so the theory only has one free parameter, this baryon density, but we have observations of three light elements. And so that means uh, uh, that we can play the game this way. Each observation, if it were perfect, would then correspond, say a perfect measurement of helium, would correspond to a single value of the baryon to photon ratio. So that would be great. In real life, Real observations have some uncertainty, so it's not a single number, it's a band, and that will correspond to a range in the baryon to photon ratio. And there'll be one range for helium, one range for deuterium, one range for lithium. Uh, and so since we have three elements, but only one uh, free parameter, the system is, uh, is over constrained, so there's a consistency check we can make. And Surreal already gave you a hint of this. If we put all the observations together, then this is what you get. These yellow bands, 
the vertical amount are the observational range and the horizontal amount is the baryon to photon baryon density range that they carve out. And you can see if you sort of squint, they at least all line up on the same plot. Here's lithium, deuterium is this tiny little thing here and lithium is over there. And they sort of all kind of roughly line up. But if you look in more detail, you say, wait a minute, helium, overlaps with the lithium range and with the deuterium range, but the lithium and deuterium do not agree with each other. So even among the light elements, they already do not agree with each other, which means we need a tiebreaker to see what's really going on. And, and the answer, what's the tiebreaker, is the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. And the CMB, among the many cosmological parameters it measures exquisitely, it measures the baryon to photon ratio, the baryon density, to better than 1%. Um, and so uh, that suggests a new strategy for testing Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The microwave background makes such a precise measurement that what we'll do is use the CMB as an input uh, and then properly taking account uh, uh, uncertainties, we can then make predictions for what all the light elements should be. And that's how we will now play the game. So let me show, and then we'll compare with observations. Okay, and this is the result of that exercise. So I'm uh, taking the input from the microwave background and then seeing what I get. Uh, and so these are likelihoods for helium, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7. And the purple distributions are likelihood. So they tell you the predictions from the CMB plus BBN theory. And the yellow are the observations. And so if you sort of stare at this for a second, what you can see, first of all, is the deuterium agreement is excellent. It's phenomenal. It agrees sort of better than it has a right to. Uh, then moving on, if we look at helium-4, the agreement is very good. We can make much sharper predictions than the observations, but the two agree very well. And notice we have two kinds of observations. The yellow are the astronomical observations. The blue is the observations from the microwave background, uh, and they all agree. Uh, but now, Go! if we move down here to lithium-7, we see that we've got a problem. The theory predicts this high lithium abundance, and the observations are down here with this low lithium abundance. Uh, the observations are about a factor of four lower than the theory, and it's like a four to five sigma discrepancy. You can see the, uh, the, the likelihoods do not overlap. This is the lithium problem. This is our problem today. Houston, we have a problem. All right. So in the face of this situation, there are two strategies. One is to say, look, I don't know quite what's going on with lithium, but we had such a good agreement with the other elements. What happens? So we'll say two out of three ain't bad. Uh, and uh, that's still part of our story today. So I'll just mention, we can then even look at new physics uh, because it turns out the light elements probe the cosmic expansion history when the light elements were formed. And from our Friedman equation in cosmology, we know that the expansion rate, the square of it, is just proportional to the energy density of the universe, which is dominated by relativistic species. The universe is uh, radiation dominated. And those relativistic species consist of electromagnetic species, pairs, uh, and photons, but also neutrinos. And so every neutrino species adds to the energy density of the universe and thus adds to the expansion rate. So the plots you've seen here are for the ordinary number of three neutrinos, but we can ask what happens if uh, we change the number of neutrinos. So there's two, three, and four. And we see that, uh, that helium changes strongly as we change the number of neutrinos. But in fact, deuterium and lithium also are sensitive to the number of neutrinos. And so that, and, but we don't even really need neutrinos. Any additional source of relativistic energy, any source of radiation will also affect the light elements. So the observed light element abundances then constrain anything that couples to gravity and perturbs the relativistic energy density. And so it doesn't really have to be neutrinos. It can be anything relativistic. But just to give you an idea of how this works, this is beautiful work that my student did. Uh, and we're showing here the baryon to photon ratio and the number of neutrinos, if we allow that to vary, and Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the CMB together very strongly constrain both of these fundamental parameters. And then we can say, here is where the standard model of particle physics say we said we should be, and uh, it's very much a, a, a picture of consistency. So our theme today, concordance, do we have concordance? In this sense, we very much do. Uh, on the other hand, we still have this lithium problem. So now let's not forget about it. I think we need to worry about it. So that's the subject of the rest of today. So let me say a little bit more about what this problem is. How is lithium measured? And this is a simplified old plot, 
But what I'm showing is lithium data, here's lithium seven, uh, uh, as a function, it's observed in these metal poor stars, these old stars in our galaxy. And so each star has some metallicity that's quite low, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three of solar. So these are very metal poor stars. And then it has some lithium abundance you measure. So each dot here, each orange dot is a star. And so I'm seeing that lithium is basically flat uh, as a function of this metallicity. But of course, uh, what the metallicity does is it grows with time. As generations of stars live and die, they increase the metallicity of the universe. And so we can see that as we go to lower and lower metallicity, we go back in time that the, the lithium abundance doesn't change. So no matter what the stars are doing, the lithium remains the same. Uh, which means the lithium isn't made in stars, it came before the stars. And so this plateau feature here, it's called the speed plateau, and it tells us lithium is primordial. That's great, lithium should be primordial. Uh, but the, the level it should be, according to the calculations I just showed you, is up here. And so there's this discrepancy, that's the lithium problem. All right, so, so we've got this lithium problem, we've got to understand how to solve it, and let me just give you an idea of how this works. So recall the standard model of particle physics plus standard nuclear physics plus standard cosmology, then when you compare to the standard observations, it leads to this mismatch. So there's this discrepancy. So to solve this problem, to, to fix this discrepancy, then at least one of these things needs to be wrong. Something has to be not standard, not straightforward. Okay. So one possible solution is simply the astrophysics, simply the observations. So here's now another set of lithium observations by Spordoni et al. now quite some time ago. So again, I'm zooming into the low metallicity region where I showed you for a good span of, of metallicity, the lithium abundances are very, very in a very tight plateau with very little scatter, but it's extremely low metallicity, 10 to the minus three of solar and below, suddenly there's a big scatter in lithium. And some of these stars have very low lithium, which means the stars have somehow destroyed the lithium they were born with. This large scatter appears. Um, and, uh, um, and this is sometimes called the, the lithium meltdown. Uh, and it's, it's, it's still, as far as, as far as I know, not very well understood. Why does this meltdown turn on and why does it turn off? Uh, and there's still a puzzling thing uh, that these points don't scatter. So even if lithium is destroyed, there's still nothing uh, 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 above this plateau level uh, and the CMB and BBN prediction. And so this region is sometimes called the lithium desert. Uh, if you ask questions, I can say a little bit more about that. There's more to say about that, but that's the general trend. Um, so, so the observational situation, it's not so clear what's going on. Um, so what about nuclear physics? Um, so maybe uh, we've assumed standard nuclear physics, we've measured all these reactions very well, the main reactions for Big Bang nuclear synthesis, but there is this beautiful idea, what if there are some reactions which have hidden very narrow resonances so that we thought these reactions were unimportant, uh, subdominant, but they could become very important and destroy lithium. Uh, and so that's akin to Hoyle's idea of a resonance uh, stimulating the production of carbon-12 in stars, a similar idea. Uh, so, uh, so this beautiful paper by Maxim Pospilov uh, uh, proposed uh, a, a, particular, a particular reaction. And then with my student, Nachikita Chakraborty, we studied uh, a systematic study of everything that destroys lithium. We proposed a couple more reactions. And the idea is in this nuclear physics space of how these resonances would work, uh, that uh, there's different amounts of lithium depending on how strong the resonance is. And for example, if we lived somewhere in this, uh, this parameter space, then the problem would be solved. So based on these predictions, nuclear physicists have uh, been hard at work and experiments have now been done and these resonances are not there. There is not a nuclear physics solution to the lithium problem. So that's out. So what about new physics? So now it's at least worthwhile to consider new physics that go beyond the standard model of particle physics. Um, so the strategy is you come up with new processes that change the light elements. And the bonus is you'd like this perturbation to be physically motivated. Uh, you wanna fix the lithium seven discrepancy. Uh, so you want the early universe to make less lithium. But the challenge is, remember deuterium and helium four still agree very well with observations. And so we don't wanna spoil that agreement. And that's the hard part. Easy to destroy lithium, hard not to mess up the other things. Um, 
And because this deuterium and lithium anti-correlation I keep talking about is quite general, it's very hard to evade. Uh, basically because, remember, we need neutrons to poison and destroy our, our beryllium, but that inevitably changes and generally produces deuterium. Uh, and the fact that we measure deuterium to better than 1% means there's very little room for mischief. Um, so just to give you one example, Carlos will give you many more, but just to give you one example that, uh, that we've spent some time on is supersymmetry. So that's this theory for uh, physics beyond the standard model that also produces dark matter. And in, in the context of supersymmetry, uh, the dark sector, the dark matter is not just a single particle, but it's got a whole complex tower of states. These states decay in the early universe and some decays occur during or after Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And then what can occur is in this supersymmetry parameter space, there are different decays which can alter the light elements uh, and generally mess them up. But if you do it just right, or at least we do it just right when we, uh, uh, when we do the calculation, uh, there's some regions that actually fix the lithium problem. Uh, so the colored regions are ruled out, the white region is, uh, is allowed or was allowed when we did this calculation. Um, now, I should note that a lot of these the supersymmetric parameter spaces ruled out by light elements, which means the Big Bang nucleosynthesis is tell us, telling us uh, information about supersymmetry that's complementary to what you get with colliders like the LHC. That's phenomenal. Um, and I should also note there's a curve here for the, uh, the, the, the Higgs mass, just to give you an idea how these things are co complementary. So this illustrates the tight links among nucleocosmo astroparticle physics, and Carlos will tell us more about this. However, I should say this calculation was done uh, some time ago. Yeah, there's the Susie sweet spot, there's a Higgs mass, it's beautiful how these all fit together. But the problem is uh, the, that was with old deuterium data, the new deuterium data kills all of this, and this, these solutions are all ruled out. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so let me, uh, let me wrap up. So let me give you my thoughts on the way forward uh, with the lithium problem. Uh, so new physics solutions, as I just alluded to, are strongly challenged by the fact that deuterium is measured so well and agrees so well with the standard prediction. Uh, so if there is new physics, it has to be rather finely tuned. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot to, uh, it, it's, it's worth thinking about this uh, because, uh, uh, because people are already thinking a lot about new physics. The fact that we haven't detected dark matter yet in the experiments we have invites new ideas, not just supersymmetry, but other uh, ideas for uh, new physics to create dark matter and it's natural to try to connect li the lithium problem to this. And that work should, absolutely should continue. Um, there are cosmological solutions, which I haven't said much about, but you can ask me, where you uh, change how cosmology works uh, during Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, and those also faced uh, challenges, which I can tell you more about. Basically, the standard cosmology works too well uh, for, in other ways. Um, nuclear experiments have ruled out a nuclear physics solution to the lithium problem. But something I can say more about is, in fact, uh, the, the predictions for deuterium, which are so critical, uh, the predictions based on Big Bang nucleosynthesis and nuclear reactions are actually not as accurate as the astronomical observations. So, uh, so we need to rectify that. And there have been some beautiful new observations that helped. And now we need to have additional measurements um, of these uh, deuterium destroying reactions. Uh, how about the astrophysics? Uh, so to destroy lithium in stars, so the abundances we measure aren't really the primordial uh, um, uh, abundance. That is still very much a live possibility. Uh, the solutions strike me as delicately tuned, but that could well be just what they are. Uh, we have this puzzling lithium meltdown where there's a lot of scatter in the lithium abundance at low metallicity that goes away. We don't really know what that's about. Um, why there's not a large scatter along the main speed plateau. Uh, and it could well be that uh, we don't understand something about the lithium destruction in the pre-main sequence. So, the, so before uh, the star enters the main sequence, there might be more lithium destruction than, uh, than has already been considered. Um, uh, more about observations. So lithium-6, I haven't said much about it. Uh, it would be, it remains an open question uh, to my mind is whether lithium-6 is even observationally determined to be present in halo stars. And it would be very uh, good to determine that because that would tell us a lot about the, the evolution of the stars and the lithium destruction. Um, and uh, I could tell you more about how interstellar lithium uh, would give us another handle on this. 
Um, and so I'm out of time. I'm sure Surreal is getting anxious. So let me just say, uh, when, we're, when we're done asking questions, uh, things you might ask me, ask me to philosophize, ask me more about the new physics, ask me about where deuterium stands these days, and I could say more about lithium-6. So with that, I thank you for your attention and turn it over to Carlos. We sure will ask you later. So Carlos, it's your turn. So please share your screen. Yes. Good. Okay. So it should now be in full screen, right? Right, it's, it's great. Right. Excellent. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. So many thanks to the uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to to think about the problem and talk about it. As you'll see in a moment, I've uh, I've been working on on this uh, very recently. Um, so I'm supposed to be wearing the uh, the new physics hat in, in this conversation, um, and therefore I want to walk you through an example of how BBN can be used. As a, as a way to probe and, and constrain new physics. Um, and the motivation for this is simply the fact that we know new physics is out there. The observed acceleration of the universe shows us that our canonical theories of cosmology and particle physics are at least incomplete and possibly incorrect. Um, I think it's becoming more and more clear that Lambda CDM is only a rough approximation, though certainly a very useful one, uh, to a more fundamental theory. Uh, that we still don't uh, don't have, um, and therefore we should be looking for and trying to characterize this uh, this new physics. And, and of course, uh, astrophysical facilities play a, a crucial role in in this search. Um, and of course, we won't know what this new physics here is until we actually find it. But I would argue that we do know to a certain extent where to look. Uh, We've known for a while uh, that fundamental scalar fields are among nature's building blocks. We now know that the Higgs field is out there. Um, and therefore, what one should envisage is the possibility that cosmological scalar fields also exist and, and play some, some important roles. These have, of course, been used uh, in cosmology for a while. It, it's actually very difficult to find a, a theoretical cosmologist who has never used a scalar field in his or her work. Um, but the important point that, that one should have in mind is that whenever you, you put a, a scalar field in your Lagrangian, the natural expectation is that this will couple to the rest of the model unless you're prepared to postulate some symmetry to suppress these couplings. Um, so naturally, you would expect the, these fields, if, if they're out there, to lead to, uh, to, to observable effects like long-range forces or what's, what's called uh, somewhat uh, peculiarly very fundamental constants. Um, and and these, are, these, of course, provide us opportunities to test and constrain these, uh, all, all these paradigms. Um, so, so there's a plethora of possible tests and th that can be done in astrophysics as well as in local experiments. Um, among these electromagnetic sector tests, electromagnetic sector couplings, um, are perhaps the, the most clean in, to the extent that, that we understand the behavior of electromagnetism. Um, and in particular, a way to test this is therefore uh, to test the behavior of the fine structure constant, which is the natural dimensionless parameter uh, that describes the, uh, the strength of the electromagnetic interaction. And this is a, a very active area of work that lots, lots of people have been working on, including my, my team and I, and there's, there's a, there's a a uh, bit of self-promotion. So this is a, a review article that I wrote a few years ago. It's getting obsolete in, in, in some aspects, but it's, it's still, I think, uh, a good starting point. Now, focusing on BBM, which is our topic for, for this afternoon, and, and here's the obligatory uh, abundances plot that you've seen a few times. Um, you already know the context. So, so BBM is a cornerstone of the Big Bang model, but it's, it's been limited for a while. Uh, by this long-standing lithium-7 problem. Um, more recently, there, there is a, a very slight discrepancy, perhaps, in deuterium abundances 
as inferred from cosmic microwave background and, and BBN, and both uh, Cyril and, and Brian have uh, recently re written papers on this. Um, now, the interesting thing about BBN, from, from my, my point of view, is that it's nicely amenable to a, to a perturbative analysis. So if you have a reliable theoretical model that you can use as, as, as a fiducial model, then you can very easily perturb that, that model and see how it's affected by changes to relevant parameters. And this includes uh, things like neutron lifetime, uh, new, number of neutrinos or variant photon ratio, and you already heard a bit how some of these things affect the, the BBN abundances. Um, one thing I've been doing recently, uh, together, together with some students, is to extend this, this perturbative analysis uh, to a broad class of grand unified models, uh, where in principle, all the gauge and, uni and Yukawa couplings are allowed to vary, and in particular where French water constant is also allowed to vary. Um, and as a slight uh, technical digression, uh, the assumptions underlying this, this class of models are that unification is assumed to occur at some high energy scale, that, that is otherwise unspecified, uh, that the weak scale is determined by dimensional transmutation, that the relative variations of all the power couplings are all the same, and that the variation of these couplings is driven by, uh, by some cosmological scale field. And for those of you who are not particle physicists, I, I don't have time to explain these in detail, so just pretend that the last 30 seconds didn't happen. Um, so in order to do this perturbative analysis, what you need to do is to, to figure out, to calculate what are, what are called sensitivity coefficients. So how each of, of the abundances is changed by a variation in, in any of the relevant parameters. So, so, so this is the... Um, this is the, the game that, that I'll play in the next few minutes. And for the, for the first couple of slides, um, so as I said, we need to choose a fiducial theoretical model to begin with. And, and for, the, for, for, the, for the next couple of slides, the, the theoretical model that I'm assuming is the one described in, in Pitou et al. 2018. And just for convenience, I'm, I'm showing on the table the theoretical abundance is uh, predicted in that model as compared to the observed abundances as recommended by the 2018 particle data group um, review, with the caveat that, that the helium tree observed abundance is not really a, a cosmological one. Um, and in the analysis I'm, I'm going to do for, for these grand unified models, um, I'm going to take three fiducial GOT models, uh, and I've chosen them because they are, they are models that work for the purpose that, that they want. There's lots of other GOT models that do not work, um, but at least three of them do. Um, and th this I'll call unification, dilaton, and, and clocks model. Now, in this perturbative analysis, essentially the, uh, the, the key relation is, is the one that you see here. Um, so what, what's nice about, about this description is that you can classify from logic all these models in terms of the relative variation of alpha and two only other parameters, R and S, one coming from uh, quantum chromodynamics, the other one coming from electric physics. So in unification and dilaton models, these R and S are fixed numbers uh, that you can calculate in these theories. What I call the clocks model is a model where R and S are free. Uh, they're free to vary, but then you marginalize them and also use a prior coming from local tests with, with atomic clocks. So these are our three models that, that I'll use for comparison. And I should also explain that when I say delta alpha over alpha, so, so, the, uh, so this is the conventional way of, of representing possible variations of alpha. What this means is alpha at the BBN epoch minus alpha today divided by alpha today. So the relative change of alpha relative to the local laboratory value. So a positive delta alpha over alpha would mean that alpha was larger at the BBN epoch than, than it than it is today. Um, and at the bottom of the slide, I, I show you three examples constrained on this parameter space. Uh, so on, on the left, I, 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 you see an analysis for the unification model. On the right, you see the analysis for the dilaton model. Um, 
I also, I also have three separate cases. What I call the baseline case is the case where I use um, the uh, deuterium, helium-4, and lithium-7 abundances. In the node case, I do not use lithium. So, so in this case, you should expect no results. Uh, I also, for completeness, include an extended case where I sort of trust the helium-3 observed abundances. But, but as you can see, uh, the error power on helium-3 is huge. So essentially, it plays no role in the analysis. Um, so one, one interesting thing that you start seeing here is that there is very little correlation between the neutron lifetime, which is plotted here is on the horizontal axis, and the relative variation of alpha. Uh, the same thing applies to the number of neutrino species, but there is a positive correlation between the baron to photon ratio and the value of alpha. And, and, and this will be important in, uh, in, in what's coming. Also, these, these bands that, that you see in the plots are the local one sigma constraints, so local priors, if you want, on these parameters. So obviously, we have local experiments that measure neutron lifetime. We have a lab constraint on the neutrino species. And you have constraints on, on the baron fraction or baron to photon ratio coming from, from the CMB, from, from Planck, for example. And if you do this analysis, one, one interesting thing you find is that these gut models are a possible solution to the lithium-7 problem for values of alpha at the BBN epoch that are larger than the local one by something over the order of 10 parts per million of, of relative variation. Um, intuitively, the reason why you might expect that, that such a solution might exist is that if you let alpha and all the other gauge and color couplings vary, uh, you would expect the effects to be larger for heavier nuclei. So conceivably, you could change the lithium abundance significantly without changing the abundances of the lighter elements too much. You have, you have a limiting factor, which, which has already been pointed out, which is the, observ the observational constraint on your theorem, which typically will, will kill you at some point. And this is the reason why only a few gut models can do this. Many of them cannot. Um, so as an illustration, uh, what the table at, at the bottom shows you is the, it are, so are the constraints on delta alpha over alpha in parts per million for the three models in either the baseline scenario where I include lithium-7 or in the null scenario where I do not include lithium-7. So clearly th th there's a preference for uh, a positive value of delta alpha over alpha at the parts per million level. Although the, the specific value is clearly model dependent. Um, on the other hand, if I exclude lithium-7 from the analysis, that then I get results that are not exactly zero, but, but uh, close to zero. Um, now, there have been some, some more recent developments. So new uh, nuclear physics cross-section measurements have been published in, in the last few months. Um, so in, in preparation for, for, for this, uh, uh, for, for, the, for this chat, I've, I've actually been revising and, and redoing this analysis and also going a little bit deeper. Um, and so in, in, the, in the rest of, of this talk, uh, I'm going to change the fiducial theoretical model. So, so the fiducial theoretical model is now going to be the one Petrou et al. 2020 that was published just a few weeks ago. And also the observed abundances are the ones recommended in the uh, latest edition of the, of the uh, particle data group review. Um, and I should also add, add as a caveat that this is very recent work and in, in some cases uh, it's results that have been obtained just a few days ago. Uh, so the results are not yet peer reviewed. Presumably someone in, in the audience will, will receive a paper to referee very soon, but bear in mind that what I'm going to say next is not yet refereed. Now I want to introduce another parameter in, in our in this conversation, which is um, what I call a depletion factor. So I'm just going to assume that uh, since it, it's certainly possible that, that lithium is destroyed by stars, I'm just going to assume that there is some depletion factor relating the primordial lithium-7 abundance to the astrophysical one, so to speak, so, so the one that, that we uh, commonly measure. This is, of course, a very simple phenomenological parameterization, but, but bear with me for at least one useful um, uh, so, so one, one useful way of, uh, of quantifying this. Um, 
so what, what you see in the slide is, is are now constraints um, on the model using um, either the baseline or extend or, or the null assumptions for the for the abundances, including the cosmological parameters and also including the, this depletion factor. And what, what, what you find is that you prefer a depletion factor of about 70%. You see, this is not a very, uh, very difficult calculation. You just divide the, uh, the observed and, and the theoretical numbers. Uh, but here I also illustrate so on the right-hand side, the slight discrepancy uh, between the, the preferred values uh, of the variant to photon ratio in BBN and, and, and the value preferred from, from the CMB and variant Lucy constellation. And, and, and I, I prevent, as I said, both uh, Cyril and, uh, and Brian in, in work with, with collaborators pointed out this, this discrepancy very recently. And of course, it's a very small discrepancy. It's about one to two sigma. Uh, but given that both of these are supposed to be very sensitive probes, what one might ask, uh, is, is there anything in this? And I'll come back to that point in a second. Um, so if I redo the, my analysis, allowing for um, variation of, of all the uh, all the fundamental couplings with the new theoretical model and the new abundances, uh, what I find is that there is still a, a few part per million preference uh, for a non-zero alpha. But if I allow this depletion factor uh, to, uh, to apply to lithium-7, uh, then the best fit values for delta alpha over alpha are significantly lower than the ones I showed a couple of slides ago. Uh, so, so, so you prefer values that are clearly less than 10 parts per million, but also the, the preferred value of the depletion drops a little bit by about one standard deviation. So it drops from 70% uh, to, to about 64 or 65%. Um, and here, so on the left, you see the posterior likelihoods for delta alpha over alpha with everything else marginalized in the three models. So, and, and you see that in the, in the case of the clocks model, the likelihood is extremely non-Gaussian. The, so the, the parameter space of these theories is, is, quite, uh, is quite convoluted. Um, and just to visually illustrate what this means, um, here you have four panels with, with the usual abundances of, of, the, of the four nuclei. So in black, you see the standard theoretical prediction, so P2L 2020. Uh, in red, you see the observed abundances with the corresponding error bars. And the magenta is the inferred uh, theoretical prediction um, in the model where I allow depletion but no variation of alpha. And then in, in green, cyan, and blue, you have the, uh, the derived theoretical predictions for the abundances in the three grand unified theory models. And in, in, in the case of, of the helium-3 observed abundance, uh, so, so the dotted error bar is meant to represent that this is, a, this is not a cosmological measurement. And also in the case of lithium-7, at the top, you, you have what, what would be the uh, cosmological abundances. And at the bottom part of the diagram, you have the, the corresponding astrophysical abundances uh, corrected by this depletion. Um, and there's several points to, to note. Um, so here you see clearly this anti-correlation between deuterium and lithium-7 that, that Brian and Cyril both pointed out. Uh, so, so this is why if you try to solve this the lithium-7 problem um, in, in grand unified theories, at some point, uh, you, you're going to be killed by, by, the, uh, by the deuterium abundance. So not all grand unified theories can do this. Uh, th there is also an anti-correlation uh, between helium-4 and helium-3. And this is, a, this is a slight moot point observationally because we cannot really measure helium-3. Uh, but but I, I do call your attention to, to the fact that in these models, you can have significantly different predictions for helium-4 or helium-3. So in particular, the Billiton model overpredicts helium-4. And in principle, this is something that, that could be testable with, with better data. Now, finally, let me ask one, one question. And, and, and I, I should uh, uh, thank Paulo Molan for uh, asking this question first. The question is, what is actually driving the alpha value? So, which of the abundances is, is, is giving you this, this, uh, this parts per million preference for a non-zero alpha? 
And once again, I, I need to extend this table and add to the table one additional line. So the line for the null case, so for the case where I do not include lithium seven. And this is what this line looks like. It's basically the same as the baseline. Um, so what this means is that the preference for a non-zero delta alpha over alpha is not due to the lithium seven problem. So, so this is something that was not manifest in the previous data, in the 2018 data, but it is a little bit clearer now. So in fact, if you take this deuterium discrepancy seriously, you can have a few parts per million variation solving this discrepancy just due to this positive correlation between the value of alpha and, and the variant photon ratio, which you can see illustrated in the, in, in the middle diagram. Um, so on, on, on the top right, you, you see the, the posterior likelihood for the variant photon ratio without the variation of alpha allowed. On the right, you, you see the same thing if you allow for a variation of alpha. So what's happening here is that this slight discrepancy in the, in the deuterium abundance or in the variant photon ratio uh, as preferred by BBN and CMB can be solved by a few parts per million variation of alpha. But this variation of alpha goes in the right direction towards solving lithium-7 problem. And that's why you only need about 64% depletion in this case, rather than 70%. Um, again, the, the, these constraints are model dependent. So you see that the correlation between the two parameters is significantly different uh, in, in the dilaton and unification models. Uh, the clocks model, the uh, posterior likelihood is, is a bit more messy as I already mentioned. Um, you can also ask, does the helium-4 abundance play a big role? The answer at the moment is not really because helium-4 is not nearly as well known as, uh, as deuterium, but it is, but it might depending on the model. So what you see on the table on the left are the constraints on delta alpha over alpha using either just deuterium or deuterium plus helium-4 and either taking the cosmological parameters, so including variant fraction and so on, fixed or letting them vary and then marginalizing them using the, uh, the priors I already mentioned. And you see that in the case of unification, basically that there's no shift. The error bars increase if you, if you allow the cosmological parameters to vary, but, but the best fit values do not change. Whereas in the Dilaton model, including helium-4, does make a difference for the reason I pointed out before. That in the Billiton model, you overproduce helium-4 a little bit. Um, so let, let me let me wrap up. Uh, so first, let, let me tell you a few things that, as a speaking with my theorist hat, I'd like to see. So obviously, improving the uh, the observed abundances of uh, of, of the uh, of, of the various. Um, Nuclei is highly desirable. Uh, in particular, if, if you can increase uh, constraints on deuterium and helium-4 by a factor of two or three, uh, we can get a very stringent test of these models and in particular confirm wh whether, wh whether this hypothetical variation of the couplings is, is there or not. Um, but, but I think it, it, it's also important to close the loop or, or to have a, a, tie, a tie breaker, as, a, as Brian mentioned. One thing that would be really crucial here, I think, would be to have a cosmological measurement of the helium-3 abundance. Because this would be a consistency test uh, of, the, of all the underlying physics. You know, it, would, it would allow us to, to be confident that we're not missing any, any important aspect of the physics. Um, and as for the uh, as for lithium seven and the eponymous problem, uh, I tend to think that its solution it's wholly or but at least to a significant part an astrophysical one. Uh, but clearly, we need to understand a little bit better what, what possible mechanisms can account for that. And this is work in, in progress. I'm, I'm I'm working on this with, with Morgan Deal, which is a, which is a colleague in, in Portal. Uh, clearly, that there's a lot more work to be to be done there. Uh, and, and to conclude, first of all, I think it's quite remarkable that BBM can constrain the strain of the electromagnetic interaction uh, to parts per million level. Um, the currently available data, you know, to the extent that you trust the uh, 
the theoretical fiducial model and the observed abundances uh, that I described shows a mild preference uh, for a value of alpha that is larger than, than, than the current one at, at, the, uh, at the few parts per million level. So two to three sigma is not uh, something to be too excited about, but it is an interesting thing to look at. Um, and I, I emphasize that a parts per million level variation would be perfectly consistent with all the other existing constraints we have on, uh, on varying couplings and on, on topology. Um, future data will, will, will enable more, more, more stringent tests on, on, on these and other fundamental physics paradigms. Um, and speaking in an ISO context, uh, the ELT uh, will, will play a leading role in, in this, hopefully. And the critical aspect of, of the ELT that, that will determine how much it can do uh, is an efficient blue wavelength coverage. So, so this is something that has to, uh, uh, to be thought of carefully, but both at the level of, uh, of the telescope, of well, the ELT itself, and at the level of the higher resolution spectrograph that, that would be doing these measurements. Uh, but, but I think I'm, I'm confident that the ELT will, will play a key role in, in these and many other Test of fundamental physics, and speaking of that, and if you allow me 20 more seconds of advertising, um, in September, good. we're organizing a doctoral school on, on fundamental cosmology uh, from the ELT and, and space observations, uh, which hopefully we'll, we'll do in person, uh, COVID permitting, and PhD students interested are, of, of course, encouraged to apply. And with that, I, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Carlos, for your presentation. So I have, um, I have directly questions after seeing your, 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 your talks. Is that you look at variation at uh, the effect of variation of the fine structure constant in time, so variation between the primordial era and today. So can we, is it possible to look at the variation in space? Because you said that this, this variation, if it comes from a scalar field, then it's can, it can be in general a variation in space time. So if we look at, perturbations or innovations cosmology, or is there a way also to constrain variation in space of this uh, fine structure constants? In, in principle, yes. Uh, I've not done it at all in, in, in the case of VBN. Uh, it's more complicated, of course, but, but yes, in, in principle, it, you can do it. Uh, I mean, if you think of in terms of inhomogeneous VBN, for example. Yes, and can it help in uh, solving the lithium problem or in changing the in moving the lithium abundance while preserving the theorem, or I would assume. Uh, well, first I haven't done it, so the uh, you know the simple, honest answer is I don't know. Uh, but I, I, my guess is that it would be very difficult uh, unless you'd have. I think you'd need to fine tune the model a lot to have sufficiently large homogeneity to give you the big factor that you need without messing up other things. Okay. Uh, so, so, so that would be my guess. You could, you could probably design a model that would do it for you, but it would be fine too. Okay, and if I want to ask the very similar questions to Brian, you alluded to it. In one of the basic assumptions of BBN, you have the fact that you're using a homogeneous universe. Indeed. And so do you see, so you said, that if we have a problem, we have to question each one of these assumptions. So do you see a possible solution coming from either perturbations or large inhomogeneity, or may, that's, I think that's what you alluded to uh, for non standard cosmology. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, there's there several several ways non-standard cosmologies have tried to attack this, but yeah. So, uh, uh, and, and in, um, there's a couple of ways of thinking about inhomogeneities. There's inhomogeneities um, sort of during BBN itself, sort of different regions of, of uh, uh, where the universe has different uh, regions of different baryon to photon ratio, different, different baryon densities. Um, and those were, those were all the rage uh, in the 90s. Uh, so old guys like me remember this. Um, and, uh, and largely, that, that's a whole subject in itself, but uh, uh, um, uh, depending on the scale, the, the link scale of the perturbations, it amounts to sort of averaging uh, um, uh, different, uh, you know, the, the, the BBN curve for different variant to photon ratios. Um, uh, but because of this anti-correlation business, basically it, it never really fixes the problem. So in the end, it doesn't, it doesn't improve the, the situation. Um, th there's another related idea that's, uh, um, that is very clever. 
It's that it's, uh, um, and it's sort of related to this Hubble constant business um, in the sense that if you imagine that we live, um, that the universe is inhomogeneous today on very large scale. So we live in a region uh, that is, uh, uh, that has a different density than, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a bubble with, uh, with one density and there's, uh, and the, uh, the, and around us, uh, there's a, there's a different density so that uh, as you stare out, you're looking into regions with different baryon to photon ratio, among other things. Uh, and so the idea is deuterium is measured at high redshift, not locally. So you can say, aha, mm -hmm. so I'm getting my deuterium measurement not from the same place I'm getting the lithium measurement and maybe that explains it. Um, in fact, uh, that's, uh, that's hard to make work in practice uh, in part because we also measure deuterium locally and, um, uh, and the deuterium measurements locally are absolutely consistent with the primordial amount we get, but it's a, it's a, it's a, and there are other, and there are other constraints on, uh, on, on how much these, these variations are allowed, but it's, it's a very clever idea. When you say locally, you mean the, the ones at redshift to 1.5 or you really mean locally? Oh, uh, deuterium, you mean, yeah. So, so yeah, so deuterium, so deuterium is measured in high redshift. So yeah, when I, so high redshift, like redshift three or so is your typical measurements, but the, but there are Milky Way measurements uh, as well, including uh, 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 low metallicity clouds, high velocity clouds they're called that are falling onto the Milky Way. And again, we see them in absorption and, uh, uh, and the uh, deuterium abundance there is absolutely consistent with the abundance at high redshift. Um, so I also want to ask you something related to what you said at the end of your uh, presentation. Is you said it's very difficult or challenging, that's the word you said, to change the value of lithium-7 without touching the term. And you didn't say impossible. So I'm sure you had something in mind. So my question is, what does it take to change lithium-7 and not changing the term? So Yeah. Well, well it is quite... I, I mean, right. Carlos has shown one of the possible... Sure. Yeah. One example, but in, in general, would, would you be able to define a class of requirements for this to work, not changing the term and changing the system seven. Right, so, uh, right, so I think, so there's a, I, I mentioned Maxim Pospolov is very clever and has worked on this problem in many aspects. And there's a beautiful suggestions he's made that others have also followed up on um, where, um, where you, because uh, the problem is, remember the, the uh, neutrons poison beryllium seven, which is what we want because they reduce the abundance. But the bad news is neutrons can also capture on protons and make deuterium. That is the source of this anti-correlation. So to, to break that, uh, what you want to do is sort of borrow the neutrons. Um, and so, uh, so Maxime had this clever idea where there's some dark matter decays um, and he tunes them carefully so that the decays um, will, uh, uh, will uh, destroy, uh, uh, will, will unbind deuterium. So much like uh, uh, Cyril was talking about uh, that uh, a high enough energy photon, a 2.2 MeV photon will unbind deuterium and make a neutron and proton. Uh, that happens early on before deuterium is formed. But the idea is after the light elements are formed, then have some decays that have uh, photons with enough energy to unbind deuterium, but not enough to destroy helium-4. Uh, and so, because once you destroy helium four, it's all over. Because then the 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 debris of helium four includes deuterium, and then that immediately creates a deuterium problem. But if you tune the dark matter just right, it can only so that it only can destroy deuterium. Then it creates neutrons, which can then kill lithium. And then the neutrons are still neutrons; they reassemble with protons, and we get back the deuterium. So we just borrowed the neutrons, basically. They killed the lithium and then come back. And so with these <laughs> class of models, which Max gets and his collaborators get with uh, with light dark matter so that the mass is just right so that uh, it can uh, it can meet these uh, criteria then you then you can solve the problem that way um, and tell us, it's quite ingenious in, in your case you said that lithium 7 is decreased the theoretical prediction but it's not you need to add an astrophysical depletion you cannot explain the full depletion just by the variation of the constants right well, I, I can in some models with you know, 20 parts per million variation. Uh, so, so, this, so, so the two papers that are already available that people can read did not have any depletion. And in these two models, you can solve the problem at least to the extent that all the abundances agree. So, so the differences between the predicted abundances and the observed ones are 
within two or three sigmas. So to, to, at least in that statistical sense, you can solve the problem. And so physically, uh, can, can you explain what makes, because how can you not change so much deuterium and change so much lithium-7? I, I think uh, so, 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 so this anti-correlation is going to be there. Mm -hmm. And I think as far as I play with all possible combinations of these parameters, so to the extent that I explore all these gut models, this anti-correlation is, is, is always there. But what you can change is the amount of the anti-correlation. You can make it mm. larger or smaller. So in some corners of parameter space, if you decrease lithium, you're going to increase deuterium, but not not, not that much, and you're still okay with, with the uh, predicted abundance. But but you do need all the gauge and Yukawa couplings to, to vary as well and give you partial constellations. Because you could also think of a model where, for example, only alpha varies and everything else is, is the same. So this is a very simple model, but of course it's easy to calculate with. And in that model, you're definitely killed by, by deuterium. You cannot solve the problem lithium seven that way. So, so you do need to pick up partial cancellations here and there to, uh, to minimize so, the correlation. If I understand correctly, if you had a much better observational measurement of deuterium, then you would have less space for these solutions. Yes, definitely. So this uh, brings me to one of the questions which has been asked by, uh, I think, um, Luca Paschini from the chat. He said, um, he's asking, I'm reading, are you not worried that the helium-4 and deuterium concordant measurement came out after CMB precise measurement. So they were, to summarize what he's writing after is that before that, the measurement of deuterium was not so good. And so we have, uh, we have a good measurement from Cook et al, 2.54 or 2.53. But this came after we knew that it was what we needed to have. So some people are worried that maybe it's what we are measuring is what we want to measure. So how confident are you that this deuterium measurement is the correct one or is a, is a reliable one. So I don't know who wants to answer, either Brian or Carlos. Uh, so maybe I can, uh, I can say Brian. a little bit about that. So, uh, so now, of course, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an observer, so I can't take credit for any of these beautiful measurements uh, by Ryan Cook and Max Patini and others. Um, but, uh, 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 you know, they, they do certainly very, very beautiful and very careful work because this is, these are 1% abundances. So this is, you know, a very difficult, a very, very difficult job. Um, and um, uh, uh, and so what I would uh, what I would say is this is I mean it's a fair question and this is something one needs to one needs to worry about um, that um, uh, the um, it the, this is this is but this is something they certainly have uh, have have worried about themselves looking at these uh, these high redshift systems and uh, and looking at the scatter among the different systems and looking for any systematic effects or their trends with metallicity, for example. And they've looked at this, to my mind, quite carefully and don't see any evidence of a, of a problem there. One of, the, uh, one of the things one has to worry about, and this was a problem in the early days when the measurements were not uh, as converged as they are now, um, is that we're looking at uh, uh, deuterium, in we're seeing it in absorption, the quasar is a light bulb, and then uh, it illuminates a, a galaxy along the line of sight. And then we see the, the Lyman alpha uh, or the Lyman series uh, absorptions, uh, uh, absorption features due to deuterium. Uh, but, and the, the idea is physics has been very kind. Deuterium and hydrogen, uh, ordinary hydrogen have a split between them, 82 kilometers a second. That's the isotope sp uh, split that allows us to measure deuterium. But uh, there also is plenty of hydrogen along these lines. So you can see absorption features that look like they're associated with a main cloud and then it has a little deuterium feature. But of course, uh, that the thing you think is deuterium could be from another cloud, an interloping cloud. Um, and, so, uh, and so in the early days, there were higher abundances of deuterium than we see today. This is like in the late 90s. Um, and, and in the end, those turned out to be interloper clouds. Um, so there's, there's always that worry, but now there's, uh, there's quite, a, quite a bit of good data to suggest that uh, as far as we can tell, the measurements have converged. This answer is uh, always just to check. This answers one of the questions which was uh, asked by Stacy McGough. It was asking what systematic could affect uh, deuterium. So, and if I, if I rephrase this question, if we forget about this measurement of deuterium, is there a value of deuterium that would just 
be okay with lithium-7 and also okay with helium-4 because helium-4 is mildly dependent on the baryon abundance. So if we forget about CMB, the fact that we know what the baryon abundance should be, let's say we want to measure the baryon abundance in the early universe and assume it's independent from the value we measure at CMB formation because it's, it's a different era and we will allow, allow for some variation of baryon abundance. Is there a deuterium measurement that would be okay with lithium-7 and we can forget about lithium-7 problem? Or, and then, of course, we would have a baryon abundance problem because it would have to evolve. But is there a way to have a consistent BBN alone? So if you like, I can, yeah. So, and, and in fact, people have looked at this. Uh, so there is a scenario, the, the parents group actually looked at this. Um, there's, a, there's a very clever scenario where, so because of this anti-correlation, uh, if we want to get uh, 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 higher, uh, uh, so if we want to, uh, to have concordance with, uh, uh, with, uh, with lithium, uh, then the, the measured lithium is low, maybe uh, uh, it would be worth one more time uh, uh, taking you to the, uh, to the SRAM plot here. Uh, so if I may, uh, Yeah, okay. So since the lithium abundance is low, it's near the, where the actual measurements are near this lithium dip, which by the way is because on this, on the low uh, baryon density side, the lithium is actually made as lithium seven and it's on the high side of this dip where it's made as beryllium seven. And of course the CMB says we live there, which is why I emphasize beryllium seven. And the, the minimum here is where they cross over and that's basically where the observations are. Um, and so that would mean we need a higher deuterium uh, and so, uh, um, and so, if for some reason, uh, so if we could explain a way, uh, uh, you know, where we expect a higher deuterium higher than we actually observe, how could you do that? Well, one way you could do that is if after Big Bang nucleosynthesis, but before these redshift three measurements, we processed an enormous most of the baryons through stars because stars destroy deuterium. Uh, deuterium is only made in the Big Bang. It's, it's essentially de destroyed by all other astrophysical processes to include stars. So if you run all the baryons through stars uh, before the observations, then you can lower the deuterium abundance and then we're fine. Um, and so that's a very mm. clever idea, but it has many constraints because those stars also make other elements like helium, like uh, metals that we don't see. But that, that would be the idea. That's one way of achieving that. You're saying that you're trading lithium depletion, depletion by deuterium depletion earlier. Exactly, so exactly. Right, right, right. And a comment by Max Pettini, so you know, who did uh, this measurement of deuterium with uh, Cook and Eta. So he said that uh, the main point of the, the measurement is not that it has changed the preferred value. I'm reading his comments, but it has decreased the error. So it's. Yeah. And um, now there is another, okay. another question on the chat and uh, something you've alluded to. Um, is that um, people are asking what are the parts, what are the sectors of the cosmological model you can constrain with BBN? Because so far you only talked about number of neutrinos and baryon to photon ratio. So if I rephrase the question, is is there a way to, to constrain dark matter from BBN? I don't know who wants to answer. Uh, Carlos or Brian, as you wish. Well, I, I guess you can certainly constrain models where you, you have decaying dark matter type things and you know something happens between the BBN epoch and the CMB epoch, for example. Uh, because, because things like baryon to photon ratio should be the same in, in both epochs. Um, so so it, it, it's, it's not... It's not a Sorry, go ahead. You think you can get constraints on dark matter annihilation or...? Yes, exactly. But you, as far as you know, you're not aware of the constraint you have on this dark matter annihilation just from the fact that it should not ruin BBN agreement or? Uh, no, not, not that I can remember. Okay. And um, can, can, I, I could. Yes, please, Brian. If I could, I'll, I'll maybe I'll use this, forgive me, as an excuse to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll answer the question in a backwards sort of way. Just to uh, this, you're not supposed to read this. Actually, this is more like art. This is just to give you an idea of all of uh, uh, of different classes 
of new physics solutions to the lithium problem. Uh, some from particle physics, which include decaying particles of various sorts. And these are very, it's a very incomplete list of references. So I apologize for everyone that I'm horribly leaving out. I just picked, picked one example here um, for each. But the, 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 I, don't want, I, I don't expect you to absorb this, just that there are uh, huge n numbers of particle physics models uh, that are attempting to solve the lithium problem. Here's some non-standard cosmology, including this Hubble bubble we just mentioned, some other things. And then the fundamental constant, of course, uh, Carlos told us all about. Um, and all of these are attempts to solve the lithium problem. And I just wanted to add, some are new, some are old, but many of them are now excluded by the precision deuterium observations, which means those observations are constraining the, these various uh, 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 ideas for dark matter and physics beyond the standard model. So maybe that's a sort of uh, backwards way of, uh, of trying to address that question. And so on this piece of art, you mentioned sterile neutrinos. So more generally, what, uh, what information can we get on neutrinos from BBN? Yeah, so uh, so Big Bang nucleus, I mean, neutrinos are, you know, that was one of the first bits of new physics that was constrained by Big Bang nucleosynthesis. My, uh, 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 my former ad advisor, uh, the late David Schramm, you know, and, and Gary Steigman together famously, famously taught us that. Um, so Big Bang nucleosynthesis not only constrains the, um, uh, it constrains any number of neutrino properties, not only the, um, the number of light neutrino species, uh, also, I mentioned that we assume that ordinarily neutrinos should be left-handed couplings. You can put constraints on, on if there are, are, are neutrinos with right-handed couplings, you can put constraints on that. You can constraints on magnetic moments. Um, and uh, so there's, there's uh, and neutrino um, uh, uh, degeneracies, whether there's a, a, a huge asymmetry between the lepton number of universe and the baryon number of the universe. And sterile neutrinos as well are another thing. So neutrinos that, uh, um, that aren't, aren't part of the three active species, the electron, muon, and tau new species, but, uh, uh, but, but, are, but are still subject to oscillations. Those can be constrained as well. So there's quite a number of neutrino properties that can be. So with the, so I'm pushing the end, but I have a final question. So one, on one of the assumptions you both mentioned is the theory of gravity that he, which is used. So Brian, you said that you're working in the framework of general relativity as a theory of gravity. And Carlos, what, you, what you're using, if I understood, is, a, is GR plus a scalar field. So I would say it's a tensor, tensor scalar theory. So for yes, gravity. yes. And so is there a possibility for BBN to constrain more general theories of gravity than just this class of uh, theories of gravity? Or the fact that it's only really sensitive to the expansion rate means that you're not, you don't have enough space to constrain more exotic theories of gravity? Carlos? Well, I, I think primarily, as you said, it's, it's sensitive to the expansion rate. So you, you, you will be constraining some effective value of Newton's constant or something like that. So, so in, in the models that, that, that I described, um, well, so what, what one has the choice of letting Newton's constant vary, i.e. the Planck mass vary, or the QCD scale vary. So you can choose one or the other. So in, in my parameterization, it's the latter that, that occurs. So particle masses, so proton mass, the QCD scale vary, and Newton's constant is fixed. But, but, but you could rephrase the constraints on, uh, on in terms of Newton's constant. So, so, so yeah, I think generically, if you think of other gravity theories, um, you could always get some constraint on, on an effective value of Newton's constant, and maybe maybe, maybe something more. But but uh, you can always translate it. Okay, I see. Yeah. And I have a last question for you, Brian. You mentioned that you can constrain independently helium four from CMB. Yes. Do Do you think that in future we could have a clean independent measurement of baryons, abundance, and helium four from CMB, such that we can you know really oppose that to BBN and see if they agree or disagree right. or? So in fact, not only that, the CMB measures, uh, uh, and as Surreal knows, uh, it measures uh, the baryon density extremely well, but now uh, also the helium abundance and the number of neutrino species. Um, and those in the next generation of CMB experiments, the CMB S4, stage four, so-called, uh, this will get even better. And then the, the helium abundances from the CMB will be as accurate as the astrophysical abundances we have now. Um, and that would be interesting for any number of reasons. For example, to show that the high redshift CMB 
uh, helium abundance is the same as the local helium abundance, and that would be another way to get at this, you know, Hubble bubble uh, question. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we are approaching the end, I'm um, going to ask you some of your final remarks. So, Carlos, so what are your? Um, do you want to make a final comment on the the concordance or the non-concordance of BBN? Well, I, I think what what what's, what's interesting to bear in mind is that how how sensitive BBN is actually to, to these things, right? And we and that we have the opportunity. To, by increasing the uh, sensitivity of astrophysical measurements, you know, such as the LT will be doing and so on, we have the opportunity to do exquisite tests of, of new physics. You know, the fact that you can test the, uh, the strength of electromagnetism to parts per million level, to me, is, is quite remarkable. You know, whether or not variations are there, the, the fact that you can test this at all, I think, is, uh, is interesting mean, enough in itself. The BN is back in the precision cosmology, I see. Yes, yes, I think so. You okay. wanted to fill the five. <laughs> yes. So, uh, well, first, I completely agree with what Carlos just said. It's amazing, you know, that this that this picture, you know, that we that we can say anything about the universe at a time of one second. It's phenomenal, and that we can do so quite accurately is amazing. Um, maybe two other quick points. One. Uh, so, what do I actually think? This is my personal view, um, and the truth is uh, on the solution to the lithium problem. And the truth is, you know, it depends on the time of day, how much coffee I've had. Um, I go back and forth between, well, it's, it might be astrophysical, or you know, maybe it could be new physics. Um, uh, but you know, I suppose if I'm brutally honest, you know, just Ocean's Razor says, you know, we could have maybe some uncertainties in how we understand lithium in stars, which after all are not simple objects, or change the laws of nature. Like, well, Ocean Razor might suggest we should we should you know think about the stars very hard. Although I still think it's absolutely worthwhile to look at these new physics ideas. And the second thing would be uh, so. Imagine there is new physics. Imagine that's really the solution. There really is new physics. If there is, nature has been incredibly kind to us because this new physics in the end was really quite gentle. It only changes the lithium abundance by a modest factor, a factor of four, while leaving the other light elements the same. And so that's very good because had the new physics radically changed the light elements, which is easy to do, most of these decaying particle scenarios are actually quite ruled out because they radically change all the light elements. If we'd had a new physics like that, then in the old days, when the, when the heroes, the Jim Peebles and uh, uh, Yakov Zeldovich, Dave Schramm, Der Gary Steigman, when they did all this stuff in the 60s and calculated the light elements, they would have horribly, dis if we had more random new physics, it would have horribly scrambled the light elements. Their ca calculations wouldn't have agreed with uh, any of the observations. And people would have said, I don't believe in this hot Big Bang picture. You guys can't even describe the, how much helium is in the universe. But that's not what happened. If there is new physics, it was so gentle that those guys still basically got it right. And only now, after we know the basic hot bag, Big Bang picture works, do we discover that there's this little perturbation. So if, th if that's true, we have to be grateful to nature for being so kind. OK, thank you to both of you. So Giacomo? Um, yes, please. yes, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for the, um, thank you, Carlos, Cyril, and Brian for this absolutely outstanding and, 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 uh, event of the great quality was really really we are very very proud and very very thankful for for making this to us thank you very much for accepting our invitation and, and for and for keeping high the our interest and, and stimulating actually our creativity and our curiosity so thank you very much i and thank you also for people for staying with us and for joining the, the talk and also we are very proud that this material we stay online so we will create a kind of legacy in a sense because people can go back and watch and i'm sure there is a lot of food for thought in this in this material so thank you very much and with this we can close as i said the next event for the duologue will be at the end of february um, and we will discuss about open science and so I, we wish you a nice day and See you soon. And if you, Carlos, Brian, and, and Cyril, please stay online. Then we, we can talk just five minutes after this. Sure. For anyone else, thank you very much. And see you next time. Bye-bye.